is with Salesforce.com um, under uh, platform security team. So I only joined them like six months ago, um, and this presentation is supposed to be uh, my happy year exercise of like mining Salesforce application logs and uh, uh, how to dive into their tremendous amount of data and making sense of uh, how their users interacting with the uh, application platform and the main focus is for security threat detection because uh, when I was paired, uh, I was paired as a, uh, uh, a security person on their trust team. Uh, what was a big surprise to me is uh, Salesforce has a uh, really big uh, security team, more than a hundred people also. Um, so this team like takes care of the entire uh, uh, spectrum of uh, security, protection, defense, uh, incident response, and uh, enterprise security. A lot of education of uh, Salesforce employee for uh, uh, secure coding uh, to both staff. And uh, before Salesforce, uh, my background has been uh, around data mining and machine learning. Uh, my previous company is called OpenDS. So they are this uh, security firm uh, started as a uh, DNS service provider. And uh, over there, I was uh, doing uh, the analysis of billions of DNS uh, lookup records. So back then, I came up with this algorithm uh, called uh, Secure Rank. And through Secure Rank is something really uh, nice and simple. It's almost like the page rank. But instead of like uh, indexing uh, web pages, it index uh, uh, host names on the internet. And with uh, analyzing the uh, collective behavior of how people look up uh, domains, uh, the algorithm detects uh, botnet command control servers. So think about it. The page rank uh, is based on the popularity or uh, the reputation of a web, uh, web page. And uh, this uh, hostname ranking uh, algorithm I came out of this looks at, uh, looks at um, how uh, malicious or uh, malware looks at their CNC domains versus how legitimate, legitimate users just doing their regular day-to-day -day internet browsing. Um, so that is one. If it is interesting, I definitely uh, like to talk more about it uh, after this. The other uh, product analysis and machine learning, uh, but it's not so much about machine learning, but more of like how I uh, kind of like try to pull my hair to figure out how Salesforce works and how the uh, app log data can make sense to everyone. So, okay, um, uh, other than the security uh, type of stuff, I used to uh, look at uh, digital hospital data for disease outbreak detection. That was fun. And uh, I used to uh, model consumer shopping behavior in physical stores 
uh, with uh, RFID tracking. So that comes a little bit uh, creepy. Um, I've done classification for uh, malicious white pillows, and uh, right now I'm doing uh, a lot of money as a source. So I found this on the internet. Um, seems wise. So if you begin with certainties, you shall end in doubts. But if you will content to begin with doubts, then you shall end in almost certainties. Um, I guess everyone would interpret it differently, uh, but for me, I think this is a way people making decisions. And this in science comes from probabilistic and statistical modeling. And today's talk, I'll uh, talk about um, what is the problem I'm trying to deal with. And uh, on the word generic term, uh, what a normal extension is, um, because uh, most of us are not really familiar with, with uh, what Salesforce is, um, me included. So um, most of the discussion will be on the general term. And uh, at the very end, I'll use Salesforce as a case study to kind of like have a more specific idea about what the thing is about. Um, and for uh, our data engineer folks, uh, there is a little bit of discussion about Apache Spark because uh, I uh, started using them just like a half months ago, half years ago, and I really like it. I just cannot stop talking about it. Um, okay, so the problem. Uh, I look at the security threat spectrum as this. The known knowns and the uh, uh, known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. I can do this all day long. Um, so, following the spectrum from left to right, we are seeing uh, problems more difficult to measure and less, uh, less uh, controlled. And, uh, of course, you can deal with the uh, unknown unknowns, then we are closer to deal with the most sinister adversaries, right? Um, no unknown, uh, no unknowns is kind of like pretty explicit, and uh, no unknowns. This is an interesting category of threats. So most of the time, uh, we can see certain footprints, like signatures, characteristics of uh, uh, threats happening in the system, but. Uh, as they evolve and as they update their configuration, then there are a lot of new things going on, and it's becoming a uh, um, it's becoming a method like using volume instead of using uh, sophistication. So, uh, these problems, correlation analysis, is um, the most obvious method we see. And I used to come up with this uh, investigative process called ripple effect. And uh, basically, it is this process starting from the seeding intelligence and how you can use statistical method and uh, use all kinds of heuristics to drive forward to, um, uh, to find out more unknown stuff based on what you already know. Uh, then, in this talk, the anomaly detection method I'll be uh, discussing is to target on the unknown unknowns. And why they are important? Because uh, they, they are the ones like we're most uh, afraid of, right? We don't know uh, in what time a evolved form is attack would be happening. And uh, so, um, for these attacks, what are the methods we are left with? Anyone care to just throw in a few thoughts or to detect unknown unknown type of attacks? What are the methods, like in a generic term, like we are left with? Thanks. <laughs> Now we have to talk about it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, behavior, behavior based analysis? Yeah. Exactly. Actually, those are the things that I'll be, uh, talk about. I'll be talking about like, in a little bit. Um, so, <coughs> we're at the situation where uh, the phishing email has been clicked and the malware has been executed and uh, 
the uh, user's credentials has been compromised. So whoever the either it's the attacker itself or the malware is already in the system and they are doing things in still small, so like we don't know they are happening. Um, okay, so that is one of the perspective defining the problem we're trying to deal with. And the other perspective is in this uh, in this application world we are seeing our detection or attack surfaces basically falling into these three big categories, infrastructure, endpoints, and uh, cloud platforms. And apparently there are more and more cloud companies and Salesforce being one of them. So the security of the cloud platform is becoming more and more critical. And uh, system being compromised, it is not really an uh, assumption, it's more of a uh, reality now. All right, so this is a solution I cannot come up with. It's like, how do we deal with the unknown unknowns? And uh, if we formulate the solution to be a combination of anomaly detection, behavior modeling, uh, statistical analysis and uh, unsupervised learning. Uh, why unsupervised learning? Uh, if you are familiar with uh, the uh, machine learning terms, um, unsupervised learning versus supervised learning, uh, the difference is uh, if we have the uh, uh, wrong truth, do we know uh, what is what? Um, for one quick example, is like, okay, for supervised learning, you can give the machine a list of um, characteristics of being Chinese versus uh, Russian. Uh, it can be the, the eye color, hair color, height, and then the machine will kind of like figure it out. Oh, now I know, like, hey, she's a Chinese based on all the characters, characteristics uh, the machine is observing. But unsupervised learning is something we don't have such label data. We don't have anything to tell the machine, okay, this is something you should be looking for, and uh, if you found this, it will be a cat or a dog. Um, and why behavior modeling? It's because, um, think of this as the uh, dynamic analysis for malware uh, sandboxing. So you'll be observing the malware doing all kinds of different stuff. And in the cloud platform or application uh, circumstances, you're seeing users interacting with the platform, using the app. They doing their day-to-day -day work, uh, executing their workflow in the system. While the malware will be doing similar, but subtly different things. So this is the behavior we're trying to model, uh, trying to observe, and uh, we want to apply statistical modeling and anomaly detection type of techniques to make the machine realize, oh, this is something bad, this is something we should um, stop here and start to get closer look at it. And uh, how is this all possible? We have all the algorithms developed, uh, technique developed, but the single most important thing is the haystack. <laughs> so we, we are kind of happy that we have this haystack is that to start with, right? That is uh, only made available because of the all the uh, uh, computer resources to dedicated to logging, right? Now we get to see everything happening in the system, and the question becomes: How do we make sense of this? And his dad's like, "Oh my God, I don't know people like me." Um. All right, um, so a little bit uh, real kind of like examples of this is that like what, what our events data look like in a, a Salesforce type of uh, platform. Um, we have entities, we have users, we have organizations, and we have uh, systems, we have uh, machines we, uh, doing all kinds of uh, uh, activities and uh, for the metadata of these entities falling into big categories in terms of uh, the idea of them, um, 
the IP addresses or pen stamps. And uh, there will be a bunch of information we derive from these uh, metadata. Well, who's the uh, who's this user? Is he on the sales for, uh, Is he on the sales team or marketing team or this is a hiring manager? And uh, from IP addresses, so we can uh, uh, infer uh, what country is this or to the geo city location. And the most interesting part is the behavior. So the interaction and the actions uh, users and systems interact with the application. So the user log in, authenticate himself, and the user start looking at a bunch of pages, maybe catch up with a uh, sales lead he's following, and then pull out all the contacts he has, and trying to figure out who should I annoy today. Um, then he will probably update a few uh, reports regarding, okay, this case has been at this phase and where they got down payment for this. Um, and uh, he might be doing passwords that because uh, he cannot remember. Um, so now, uh, after a quick look at what his stack is, um, I want to talk about the challenges. Uh, why? Because if I don't talk about them, then you you be like, oh yeah, this method. There will be tons of challenges of them. Um, so the first one, obviously, what we are doing dealing with is a rare event detection problem, and it is rare event detection. So all the things we try to detect, they are in really small odds. Uh, that's a good thing, right? Um, Consider the extreme, which is the uh, terrorism detection. How do you really cannot, uh, detect a terrorist attack happening? Um, from all the data, all the things happening in the world, all these events can be simply considered statistically, uh, statistical noise. Um, most of the uh, sampling methods and what our smart methods been uh, using in the statistical world, they will be useless because we cannot do a lot of things there, right? Sampling is, is one of them. If we do sampling, then the, it's obvious like, can we sample the right stuff? Um, at the same time, what our models or what our behavior uh, uh, methods we built up, there's a chance, this is a game theory, there's a chance the uh, attackers will be smart, smart enough to adapt to the system and try to beat the behavior model. Try to like behave not as anomalous as you might think. Um, and also, I probably don't want to mention like what is the size of the Salesforce ad block and uh, what is the uh, event uh, rate per second then uh, you feel free to take a guess. So with such a big data, here comes big mistakes, right? Um, we, we, we are blessed because uh, the data storage or uh, distributed computing technologies has allowed us to really uh, calculate things on such a scale. But uh, um, at the same time, uh, what is a robust enough error rate? Okay, let's say 0.001%. It is pretty, pretty low uh, error rate. Uh, regardless what uh, classification models you have seen or whatever, um, um, machine or data-driven kind of models uh, you have had a uh, play with, 0.001% and it's a really low error rate. But here's the thing. We have a few billions of things we have to make in detection upon. And uh, this 0.001% times a billion then it becomes a uh, pretty big um, false positive pool. So how do we deal with that? Um, 
Some difficult, uh, some more technical problems are introduced by distributed computing here. Correlation is hard, and because uh, uh, because of how the data is organized in the uh, distributed system, uh, ordering is hard. So, how can I be smart about that? Um, on that side. I want to show this picture because I learned this uh, use case from a presentation by a uh, Berkeley professor who is in astronomy. So this is a picture from uh, that that presentation, and uh, for anyone can can uh, guess what this is about. Is it a comet? Not a comet. It looks like a comet for sure, okay. and the, the code is cannot. I, I don't read it how the S six hundred code thing. Um, this is part of the galaxy for sure, and this little thing, the little blue dot pointed out there, that is a supernova. So, what the professor and his colleagues did is, um, they have this giant, <laughs> tiny, uh, super telescope. I don't know, maybe there's uh, there's a name for it. So they have this giant telescope there and uh, scanning the universe or part of the universe day and night and they are collecting um, a few billion of data points a day and uh, coming up to total 20 terabytes of data a day. So all the movement, all the color, all the diameter, all kinds of like different characteristics they can think of to um, model a, I don't want to call it a star, then the objects in the universe. And uh, with all this uh, data, they uh, use a anomaly detection approach to detect this supernova being formed. 10 hours before it comes to um, uh, comes to comes to uh, real detection by uh, a normal regular method. So what I'm trying to say here is uh, this is a really small rare event, and uh, what people have done there has been really inspiring. And uh, why we cannot do something like that? So the real opportunity lies in today we have this gigantic, gigantic logging infrastructure and we can decide what we want to log about the system. So we keep track of every single footprint of what's happening here. And at the end of the day, our uh, approach or our system should be able to make a good sense of all this data. All right, so what about the method? Anomaly detection, that's, that's really think about what is anomaly. This photo is two by two, a two dimension space, and uh, each of uh, the individual case is just uh, symbolized as a wrong dot. Um, we can uh, call out the, the, the one in the recycle as a nothing, but what about this little thing in the green circle? Is this a nothing or not? So it almost becomes a uh, philosophical question. How do we determine a nothing? And uh, statistically, most often we uh, formulate this as bounded by the error rate. How many errors can you afford to pick up at things as a normal? <coughs> and uh, with Salesforce as an example, a few heuristic scenarios, what a anomaly behavior we can see from a user. So is a user stepping through a multi-step business process in the wrong order? That means we have to have a way to model the other the sequence of such behavior. And does this user access uh, things like with uh, insufficient permissions? 
then we have to have this data model to record every object and every user and their permission sets mapping. Is the user exceeding his individual user specific action threshold? That means do we have a threshold to impose on each user and what the threshold should be? And is the user seen from uh, two IP addresses countries concurrently? Of course, that happens quite often, more often than you can imagine. There is all kinds of like different, um, different scenarios. People are doing this. They one scenario can be their cookie has been stolen and used by a attacker, or this user is sharing his cookie on purpose, so they don't need to buy multiple licenses for their organization. Um, well, if we get into um, data mining type of terms, the anomaly detection methods normally map into two big categories. And one is the uh, distance based. And a bunch of items there. Um, nearest neighbor, uh, SVM, single class SVM, or unsupervised random forest. So, there are a lot of choices, but it all depends on how we want to model this problem. Uh, what about the, uh, the uh, sequence of these behaviors? So the other number is the uh, sequence-based anomaly detection. And this concerns with um, the, we can call it the path, a user, towards when it interacts with the application. And uh, there is a probability associated with each of the paths. So a lower probability versus a higher probability, do, are they considered anomaly versus uh, a uh, normality? So when I think of this, I just uh, imagine there is a two dimension space. And uh, one dimension is the billion of users, or even multi, uh, tens of million of users, and uh, the other dimension is time. So as time evolves, the user will uh, come to this point to do such a thing, and at another date point, time point, this user will do something uh, subsequently. So with a sequence based method, we'll be able to capture this user from his own uh, own history uh, to the uh, current state of this user. And this user can be considered anomalous if he's behaving really different from himself or look at the, uh, when we take a snapshot of the uh, two dimensional space, we'll be looking at millions of users. And among these millions of users, we'll be seeing of uh, this hundred or thousands of users, they are behaving really different from the rest of the group. So, at the end of the day, the solution is supposed to be the combination of both of those uh, two categories of methods. Um, and a little bit high level design of the detection system, I call it profiling based adaptive signaling. So, this takes care of the history part. This uh, is uh, supposed to capture the um, how a user's uh, current behavior differs from its pre uh, previous behavior. So all the history, all the things has been logged in the system and uh, we'll have to go into the, the phase where we uh, model such patterns and profile these users and uh, define the norm, uh, normality of this user and uh, come to this uh, data abstraction called profiles. Then as we observe uh, current actions of a user, our detection engine will come into play. So look into a bit detail about this detection engine, uh, Threat Seeker. We are 
processing these logs either in batch or in a streaming mode. Basically, we're absorbing everything happening in the system. And um, they extract interesting events here. We call this SE events, uh, which is a sensitive action event. So, in terms of behavior, we have the simplest um, rationale. Basically, the attacker, whatever they do in the system, they try to get something and they want to turn it into profit, into monetary value. So, most of, the, uh, most of their actions will be something more or less falling into creating admins, resetting passwords, or exporting data, exporting uh, sales contacts, um, things like that, uh, or things similar. And we have a bunch of behavior to signal translation engines that uh, that translate the action data into um, into different signal. And these signals would have a more concise indication of whether the user is doing something just legitimate or uh, malicious. Some example of uh, these uh, translating these behavior into signal. So there are read analysis. So how often this user making such a call and uh, how often this user uh, invokes this uh, API uh, calls. And there's such analysis. So a lot of times we are seeing uh, concurrent, uh, concurrent behavior from multiple IP addresses and from multiple countries across the continent. So, is it a session hijacking type of um, attack? And uh, the other part will be uh, the uh, geolocation analysis. And sensitive action is the other category we uh, monitor very closely. Also, the high frequency API yeah, calls. So that is a very high level design of this uh, detection method. And uh, why this method is valid or useful? First of all, um, we are dealing with the uh, unknown unknowns. So um, we have to make sure that like, our method requires minimum to none per all per all knowledge of these attack patterns. Um, as we are building uh, the profiles and uh, uh, monitor a user's uh, history closely, these models are supposed to be adaptive to user behavior changes. So, normal users do all kinds of weird things, right? If you, uh, if the system is static, if it doesn't adapt to all these legitimate changes, then the system will be pretty much useless because it's detecting so much like nonsense stuff. Uh, at last, methods should be adjusting very this level of user behavior volatility because uh, different users, um, their behavior changes would be uh, would not be uniform among themselves. Some users will be more predictable other than the rest of them. So the uh, notation for mo uh, to model such uh, uh, various level of uh, behavior changes, we use uh, entropy. For example, we see some users coming to uh, a bunch of different IP addresses, but they do this day in and day out. In the, in the past three months, they've been doing this. So this would be less of a signal compared to a user who has been coming from a single or just a couple of IP addresses in the past, but all of a sudden, this user account has been accessed from uh, tens or 
and to resolve conflicts or IP addresses. All right, um, now come to the part of the spark. So, um, all this is only possible because of the big data technologies. And, uh, and when the has started to, I've been dealing with small data like in the most part of my life. And only after I joined OpenDS, that is where I started picking up all the big data technology. Hadoop, Pig, Hive, and a bunch of other hippie terms, as we call it. Um, and uh, this is uh, the most recent step like, I, I'll be using. So we have this event selection and management part. And for data storage, we have this Hadoop part. And uh, Apache Spark is a uh, is a uh, in-memory computing engine, which turned out to be really fast and efficient. And the whole technology package supports machine learning, uh, all kinds of statistical modeling technique. Um, and uh, it has a nice interface with Python. Uh, Spark is native in Scala. But uh, since I'm a Python person, so I'll be using PY Spark. And uh, to uh, complete this picture, of course, the detection has to be fed into a response and feedback uh, loop. So it's not supposed to be a Spark uh, tutorial, but uh, mm, I think my little experience about Spark, uh, using Spark in this uh, application may be useful to some of you. Um, so a person spark is something you should, once you uh, get your hands on, you can just pretty much forget about how to and my produce. The speed or the efficiency wise, uh, the comparison can be seen in the histogram. Uh, and it supports uh, a, a complete uh, package of different libraries Spark SQL uh, streaming and uh, machine learning, and also has a graph uh, analytics computing engine. Now, how is it? Uh, how easy is it to, to, to use? So, if you are a Python person, then to uh, start translate your Python object into Spark is as simple as just use this uh, Spark context as C dot uh, parallelize. So basically, uh, your Python object will be becoming a uh, resilient distributive data set. It's RDB. And it can be uh, spread across multiple data nodes. And uh, vice versa, you can translate a uh, Spark data set into a Python object just uh, using the simple function called dot flat. Um, in PY Spark, the mapping uh, or transforming uh, function call is the uh, dot map function. And you can also do uh, group by keys or reduce by keys uh, fairly easily. Uh, and this paired RDB is a pretty important concept. Paired uh, RDB uh, use this key value pair to represent your data. And you can uh, easily to group on the keys and reduce by the keys and to get the aggregated statistics you want. Okay, just a little bit more about your PY Spark. Um, for people with uh, experience uh, of PID or Hive, uh, normally uh, the user defined function is the uh, uh, customized logic you want to implement, but there's a lot of difficulty. But in PY Spark, uh, such user defined functions can be simply. Uh, can be simply implemented in, Spark, uh, in Python, and uh, such functions can be uh, called in PySpark environment. 
just with uh, one statement. All right, uh, so this is almost the end of the discussion. Uh, a quick case study. Um, so how does Salesforce app work? Um, it took me six months to sort of make sense how it works and uh, what are the uh, log data is constantly speaking out. So the, the font size kind of scales to the amount of work I've been doing. One, one a real picture um, of the uh, Salesforce, um, the sales apps workflow. That's how a salesperson generates a report and manage contacts and uh, um, update uh, opportunity, etc. etc. So with this picture, I just want to give you an idea like uh, what is the complexity of the data and at the same time the richness of the ad log, how we can capture the entire workflow of each user. Um, at the same time, um, this picture shows you, wow, how do we kind of model such a behavior? Um, now I'm using the same slide of uh, the ad events data. What are they? Um, the main categories of them. And the example detection model here includes a few uh, signals, including the uh, positive signals versus the negative signal. So positive signal, I've covered most of them. So what if we are seeing this new IP, and what if we are seeing this uh, user coming from uh, multiple countries at the same time, or what if we are seeing this user doing something really different from um, his past behavior, and uh, what if this user has a really uh, short interval between his login versus uh, start uh, downloading data, start uh, exporting reports or contacts into uh, out, out of the platform, or are we seeing like very multiple user agents in the con uh, concurrent session? And there are also negative signals. Those are the ones that we uh, we use to indicate like this user is more likely to be a legitimate user versus a hacker. And at the end of the day, we'll need a smart way to combine all the uh, signals and do a step ranking to uh, generate this list of events that we find we need to further investigate. For step ranking algorithm, uh, there is a number of choices, numeric uh, approaches, or unsupervised learning, or bad propagation approach or even statistic, uh, stochastic modeling. So at the end of the day, we want to optimize the system to detect the most uh, positive cases that uh, minimize the uh, number of uh, errors. So that's about it. Uh, that's the framework, and that is a prototype. And uh, there are a lot of opportunities here. So we always keep these uh, question marks in mind when we develop anything in this direction. So we conserve as false alarms and uh, can our method deal with uh, mind in the middle, uh, mind in the browser. And uh, what about uh, new users? What about users with behavior who haven't started uh, modeling. Also, what about multiple stage attacks? And the last question is, um, when I was at the uh, Berkeley's professor presentation, I asked him, so with this 20 terabytes of data, with this um, billions of stars in the sky when you're trying to uh, observe and discover new things, how many uh, false positives, how many cases like you discover a day that turn out to be to be false. So his answer is like 30. Well, 30 is the 
how to say, is it a good number? We don't know. But think about it. This supernova detection only happens once a few years. So you, you should you be spending your life dealing with the 30 false cases on a daily basis. Then is it worth it? Well, my take is uh, at Amazon started doing recommendation 15 years ago. Um, we just find it like so funky and so annoying. But nowadays, it's like re recommendation is pretty much part of life. It's on LinkedIn and it's on Twitter and it's on Google search pages. So we still find it annoying, but uh, it sometimes turns out to be useful or less forky. So I think all the things take patience, but uh, at the end of the day, I think it's worth it. And that's all. I only have. We don't have it, have the loop right now, but um, feedback loop is such an important uh, concept here. It's like uh, when we do the detection every day, then a lot of times we'll keep detecting the same, the same scenario just because it's so weird. And uh, if we don't take it back into the loop and uh, incorporate it somewhere uh, upstream of the detection, detection chain, then we'll be making the same mistake over and over. So that's definitely a critical and necessary loop up there. Yeah, it seems to me it might be related to that very false positive that the astronomer was doing for good. Because if they could analyze why it was false positive, it would be that that could make it lower than uh, yeah, uh, I didn't have that follow-up question for him, but uh, what I would imagine is they will take this back into their training set and probably uh, label this as, you know what, this is a false positive and do not yeah, classify it again. Um, but uh, even with that, we'll be still uh, seeing new weird things and uh, making new mistakes, so. So are, are you applying protection to Salesforce now? And if you're detecting these anomalies, are you now enabling protection for your data and based on your, what can be a high threat ranker score you might see in the uh, We are, but it is a, a back end implementation right now. So this is not a feature in the product itself. We um, we have this at back end, and uh, we are generating, you know, uh, detection results. But uh, all this is not visible to anyone who's using Salesforce because uh, this is uh, it's being still being improved and uh, further um, tested. How often do you have to maintain the kernel? Uh, that's a good question. Um, this depends. For our testing so far, we have to return it on a daily basis, but uh, um, in the long run, we want to have this more of, um, more of like a uh, online learning thing. So is it like going to be per minute or per event for training? So that is the ultimate goal we're trying to apply. I can take a quick 
As I understand, you were asking like, okay, can we look at this as like a collection of mini classifier, and each individual classifier will be trained on a different time scale or a different set of data. And, um, yes, that is not something happening right now, but uh, that is definitely the way to go, okay? Because uh, considering a different perspective of behavior, each mini classifier will be modeling, and uh, some behavior will change more often than the rest of them. So, yeah. All right, I think my time is up. Thank you, everyone, for coming to my talk. Like, I'll be good morning, good morning, and the beach is right over there. Thanks. Thanks.